Hey everybody, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Idaho. I know we got some real toughies in Idaho who can make use of this information, and we saw some good territory in the state in the NCA4. Let's see how it's holding up in these updated projections. Little background for this update. When I founded American Resiliency in 21 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think we were going to hit 2C at mid-century. It was the consensus science. There were a lot of signs that we were on track on those models. But that was then. 2023, as you know, because you also lived, it was a very serious year in climate. We hit 2C for a couple of days towards the end of that year. And we've been at or above 2C a few days here in 2024. 2023 was the first year we spent over 1.5C above the pre-industrial baseline violating the Paris Accords. So that's got to force us to change our thinking. This outlook, it's a 2C outlook. We're going to get there when we get there. This is kind of a bad road trip we're all stuck on. We might as well get ready. Let's check out the challenge level for Idaho at 2C. Just so you know where to find my source material, this forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment, which was just updated. We got new update in November of 23. We're not going to get another one until at least 2028. There have been some significant changes in the projections in this new edition. We're updating the outlook for every state. And if you want to follow along with me, it's very easy to go to chapters, hit all figures. I'll refer to the figures by number so you can follow along. They're all downloadable so that you can get them for offline access. They come out in a nice zip file. I have them on my computer. I recommend it. We use the fifth national climate assessment because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document, and you deserve access to the information. As a matter of congressional mandate related to the National Climate Assessment, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about this important information. That made me so mad I founded this nonprofit, the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the general public. We run on your donations, and we're going to keep running thanks to your generosity. Looking at figure 1.14, which gives us sort of a national overview of the change landscape, you can see that Idaho is the first state we're doing in this revised NCA5 series that intersects with the ominous high change blob over Utah. The higher change blob over Utah is concerning and speaks to the fact that many people on the ground have been reporting higher levels of change in Utah than were projected in the NCA4. Let's see if the new information is more in line with those reality checks once we get over to Utah, because I haven't heard a lot of people saying anything super ominous about Idaho. So, so don't worry. Overall, across the state of Idaho, you're going to be looking at between five and seven degrees of total warming. Let's get some details on that change and how it'll fall around the year in figure 2.11. This is kind of a gigantic figure, and it gives us a good chance to look at changes to seasonality. And we do see some changes, particularly around hot days and cold loss. Let's get into, let's look at the details for Idaho. So this is the map for additional hot days, additional days over 95. It looks like we've got some major hot spots in Boise and Twin Falls and to a lesser extent up there in Moscow. It's looking like about a month of additional days over 95 in Boise and Twin Falls, maybe three weeks in Moscow, and that is a significant heat up. That's additional weeks over 95. But we have some good news in the additional nights over 70 department. Let's get over to the warm nights map. So you can see we're on a different figure there. This is the additional nights over 70. And while we do see that's maybe a week, that darker smear of additional hot nights at 2C around Boise, the rest of the state is looking to get less than five days of additional warm nights. So that daytime heat, that daytime heat up is a problem, but it looks like you will have a chance to recover. Having more cool nights, that's much less dangerous for human health. It's also better for the health of mature plants. Looking at the cold, here we're dealing with the loss of days under 32. So the darker the color, the more days you're losing below freezing. And you can see we have a dramatic picture here for cold loss in Idaho. So the most intense cold loss in the nation is now forecast for Idaho, centered up in the panhandle in the St. Joe Mountains. However, this is important. What about the mountains more in the center of the state, like in the Salmon Chalet National Forest? You can see that's a totally different picture from the panhandle. You're keeping up to 20 days more cold in the central mountains than you are in the panhandle. Those mountains in central Idaho were projected in the NCA4 to stay skiable the longest in the region, longer than any of Washington's skiable mountains, and we are seeing that hope persist here in the NCA5. That's cool. And thinking about
about cold, thinking about the snowpack, as we zero in on that, let's look at the intensity, not just the duration of cold. Let's look at plant hardiness zones and put some more info together. So this figure, 1.13, is where we're able to look at projected changes in plant hardiness zones across the nation. We've got present-day climate normals, mid-century projections, and late-century projections. This is equivalent to a 2C projection, and this is equivalent to a 3C. So it's good for you to know 3C information is readily available. I'm going to focus in on present day and 2C so that we can look at that first step. And let's go to a SNP out of this large figure so we can see it more clearly for Idaho. All right, here we are in the SNP, and you can see that that is a big change if you look at those hot spots, there's some hot spots there in Moscow and in Boise. That looks to me like you're going a freaking 9A at 2C in those areas. You've got at least a 10 degree lift projected in your winter lows. And freaking 9A, you can grow figs. 9A in Moscow, that's, that's a lot to take in. This is a lot of the state here that's seeing two to three zone shifts. That's pretty big winter cold loss, although you do see it's moderated here in those central mountains and more extreme up in the panhandle. Let's get an eye on how much stress we're talking about here on the total system. We got to get our eyes on projected water changes to put these pieces together. All right, here we are in figure two, 10, and at a glance, this is some good news. You know, it's looking so hot in the Snake River Valley with those additional days over 95 and that big winter warming. We really needed to see some additional precipitation there to help stabilize the landscapes, and it looks like you're going to get it. There's a 10% statistically significant increase in precipitation projected over much of the state, 15% over the valley. That's good news. Let's check out another model and get some more details in figure 4.3. All right, in 4.3, it looks like there is some more rain falling on the central mountains too. That's good. And this is very important. Even in the driest breakout of those ensemble models, look, you've got increased moisture projected in the Snake River Valley. I think this is really good, really important news. I'm so happy to see that indicator in 4.3 that the Snake River Valley is likely to avoid a catastrophic drought. I think that's very encouraging. And I want to take you and get you a little close up also on the hope there in figure 4.6. We're looking at soil moisture. And you can see over by my house, we look like we've got good potential for continued agriculture, good increase in soil moisture. I've talked to farmers, they're not concerned that that's like too much. You can see there's a drying trend over much of the country, but check this out. As we get zoomed in right around Boise, small potential for increased soil moisture, small potential for growing more interesting stuff. And there is interesting stuff you can grow that's hardy at zone 9A. Zooming back out though, I'm like, what's up with the panhandle? This is some very serious decreases in soil moisture by mid-century projected up in the panhandle. Let's get some more information. Here we are in figure 4.5. That's changes in your snow water equivalent by mid-century. And it is looking really dark there. You know, over here where it's looking darker in these mountains, we saw increased rain projected in figure 4.3 about to offset this loss in 4.5 but over here we didn't see more rain coming in 4.3 and in 4.5 the loss of snow water is really substantial putting that information together i'd be very concerned about the kanisku national forest in terms of that forest health and in terms of wildfire potential there's a projected snow water deficit there that's not looking to be made up with additional rain if you're in a watershed in that area up in the panhandle, I'd have a high concern for serious drought and serious landscape changes. Let's see how that's expressed related to fire danger. Let's go look over in figure 7.4, the fire map. So I hope you can forgive me for having to show you figure 7.4 because this map is so hard to read. I kind of feel like it's been made hard to read on purpose. What are these blobs? I don't think they're even watersheds. They don't track well to watersheds in my region where I have a better idea of what's going on. Let's walk through it. Let's see how you read this. So this is your historical fire danger based on data from 71 to 2000, expressed as your average number of days where there were conditions for really large fires in fire season. And it shouldn't shock you that in this Idaho-ish area, there's been some danger of fire. There's historical danger of fire. And we can see when we look at the projected change, it changes in the percentage of the number of days. 
Doesn't this seem like a deliberately hard to read map to you? I, I hate trying to work with this thing, particularly for states that intersect many different areas. You can see that overall in our Idaho-ish area, we're looking at pretty big percentage change in number of days as we move towards the mid-century. And I think that we're talking about a range from about 150% down here in the valley to up here in that area that we were looking at that probably had really high risk, we're talking about more like a 400% increase. So doing the math here for this area that looks like it's really high risk, we had moved from having about 0.1 to 0.25 days a year. So maybe year every four years where there was high fire conditions, multiply it by 400%, that means every year there's going to be at least one day with really high fire conditions. And that's bad. You know, that's as bad as we used to go to for the top of this figure in the historical data. That's what you used to see around this vulnerable line in the Sierras where we did see such terrible burning. So go to 7.4. If you want to do the math for yourself, overlay this on Google Maps so that you can figure out which blob you're in and you're gonna to need to multiply number one by number two so that you can get your actual fire risk. Overall, we're looking at elevated fire risks with the risks not increasing as much in places that previously had high fire danger. In areas with lower fire danger, historically, we see larger risks. This is a challenging outlook, Idaho, but it's not one without hope, particularly if you're in the Snake River Valley. That's a highly rechargeable aquifer and your most nearby mountains are officially the mountains with the healthiest snow projections in the region. That's cool. I think these projections indicate you're going to get enough water to keep going. I also think our friends up in Moscow, Idaho, will be picking up the edge of that continued strength that we do see in eastern Washington as well. For both of those more highly populated areas, the Snake River Valley and that little dip in by Moscow in the north, you're looking at shifting, though, to a very different climate. It's not one that's necessarily bad, but it is different. We have a commissioned video coming out that I'm making for Boise, Idaho, that'll help you get a deeper understanding of the projected changes to your area at both 2C and 3C. That'll be coming out soon. And I do recommend that if you're in this area, you keep an eye out for that. I wanna thank HG Architecture for their commission on this and for your work building resilience in Boise. If you want to get your home ready for the changes that are coming, these are the folks who will help you with the heavy lifting. They're good people. Looking outside of those more densely populated regions, overall for the state, we see there are probable big landscape changes in these projections, particularly on the panhandle, most particularly on the eastern side of the panhandle. It looks like Montana is going to have some big changes there too. Wildfire danger is going to be high. I definitely want to consider air quality if I were building my resilience in Idaho anywhere in the state. A good air purifier is increasingly important for basically everyone as we deal with the reality of Canada likely having a pretty terrible fire season this year. It's rough, but we can deal with these problems better by facing them than by not facing them. We can prepare for what's coming. And for most of you folks living in Idaho, it looks like the cards are falling right where you could rationally justify preparing in place. Let's get to work. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching and thanks for joining us. AR has recently passed a milestone. We've reached more than 100,000 people in America with detailed local climate information. And it's thanks to the incredible support of the AR community. There are so many folks committing their financial resources, their energy, their time to helping this information get out there. I'm so grateful to all of you, and I'm so glad that we're doing this together. Thanks for being there with me. I'm going to keep an eye on the news. I'm going to keep an eye on high consensus science. I'm going to try and get you what you need as we go through this together.